All right, welcome back, everyone. We are shifting gears and heading straight for tech, delivering the keynote on artificial intelligence. I'd like to welcome onto the stage His Excellency Umar bin Sultan Al Ulama, Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence, Digital Economy, and Remote Work Applications. Please give him a warm round of applause. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure and a fascinating day for all of us here to talk about a very important topic for each and every single individual living in each and every single civilization, community, and country in the world. I'm here actually to advocate for a future, one that might be getting a lot of criticism, but also brings with it a lot of promise. I'm here to talk about the role that artificial intelligence is going to play in our future, in the future of creating culture, in the future of creating knowledge, and in the future as well of creating content. I'd like to start with asking a question. And I want each and every single person to try to guess which one of these art pieces do you think is generated by an AI? Can anyone guess? Just point with your hands, left or right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a vote. For those of you who think it's on the right, raise your hand. For those of you who think that it's in the middle, raise your hands. OK, not many people for the middle. And on the left? So it is the art piece or the artwork that's on the left, the far left, under the word can. This art piece was generated using a robotic arm, and an algorithm was actually designed to paint with a brush with a specific type of stroke, very similar to what, how humans paint and how humans express themselves. The other pieces of work were actually generated by humans. So we've reached a point today where the convergence of the digital and the physical has come to become a reality. We're seeing artworks that are generated by artificial intelligence, and we cannot really identify which one is human-driven and which one is programmed. This, as a trend, has created a new wave of investments, a new wave of auctions, a new wave of excitement of people investing in AI art, trying to create a new renaissance of some sort, where we're seeing art pieces that are developed by an algorithm that don't actually have a specific creator. The creator is an algorithm. And the code itself isn't a design. It's a code where many of these uh, systems are trained on art pieces and then are allowed to express themselves freely. So the very first AI-generated art piece sold at Christie's for around $432,000. But we're also seeing another uh, world where we're seeing decentralized autonomous organizations, or DAOs as they're known, where people are using algorithms to create AI digitally generated art for the NFT or the virtual realm. And those today are charging millions of dollars for people who are going into this field. So it is slowly but surely becoming a reality, a, real, a reality for the creatives, a reality for the community, and a reality for our world. There is another element of using artificial intelligence which I think is very interesting. Uh, this is a Rem Rembrandt uh, painting that was actually chopped or cropped to fit into a frame and be put into the city hall at the time. The issue with it is when they wanted to restore it and they wanted to expand the piece into its original size, there were a lot of issues with actually going about and doing that. But through AI-generated assistant assistance, we were able to re-expand it and restore it to its original size and its original beauty. So AI is being used both to create art and also to restore art in ways that we've never seen before. 
And this actually is something that really excites me. I know that Rafiq Anadol is, is actually going to speak right after me or as part of this conference. And we're seeing now new expressions of art where people are developing algorithms that create art pieces that look magical. They look some sort of like a lucid dream where it can't help you but stop to take a look, get inspired by it, appreciate it, and take a picture. Uh, this art piece specifically, and I hope that Rafiq actually uh, corrects me if I'm wrong, was inspired by coral. And the coral itself was fed into an algorithm that allowed this piece specifically to be developed. And it's currently in Miami. Now, all of these pieces that we talked about in the past are ways in which artificial intelligence is being used to disrupt art. And I think art and culture are, first and foremost, the fields that we thought AI could not disrupt. The fields that we thought AI is going to be steering far away from because it requires human ingenuity. But we are seeing now that these systems are surely becoming tools that we can use to create new forms of expression, but also tools that we need to take seriously in the future of governing this field. I want to take you now down to literature. And literature, in a sense, is something that people consider very human-driven. We are social creatures that use speech, that use text to express ourselves. And we don't think that artificial intelligence can actually play a role in this. This specific example is an example that was developed by an artificial intelligence algorithm that was fed every single Shakespeare poem and wrote a piece of poetry that people could not actually identify whether it's Shakespeare, actual Shakespeare or if it's developed by an artificial intelligence algorithm. The quality of writing, the punctuation, the grammar, the style is exactly as Shakespeare used to write. And they did a test where eight out of 10 people that are considered experts looked at it and could not tell the difference. Some of them actually thought the one on top, which is an actual piece of Shakespearean literature, they thought that was the artificial intelligence developed uh, piece of literature. So it is advancing quite quickly. It's going into multiple different facets and multiple different sides of our lives. We're also seeing it here in Expo 2020. We're seeing it being expressed front and center within one of the most beautiful pavilions in the Expo, the UK pavilion. And this pavilion actually was, was a expression of human ingenuity in developing technology. And in a sense, what happened was they developed an algorithm that was fed 15,000 poems of over 100 British poets. And then it actually went and started to generate AI verses of poetry. Now, not all of it makes sense, but the fact of the matter that it can write something that can be considered a beautiful piece of literature is fascinating on its own. Imagine what will happen in five or 10 years down the line. How will it be able to express itself? And how will we be able to use these tools to go forward? I don't want to stand here and actually tell you that you are going to be replaced by artificial intelligence because if anything, I actually want to promote the fact that we are going to be enabled by AI. So I'd love to actually give you a few examples of where artificial intelligence can help us make ourselves better and improve ourselves. This is an example of a summary that was generated by an artificial intelligence algorithm that was developed by a uh, research firm called OpenAI. And this summary is the best summary of a 26,000 word book that exists today. So for humans to be able to condense 26,000 words into a 136 word summary is near impossible. But because this algorithm was able to read this book multiple times over and extract the key points of it, it generated a 136 word summary. And these tools are being used today to give people that are too busy to read books summaries of the books that they like to read. So we hear about Blinkist, we hear about Audible, we hear about um, different platforms that summarize content. These tools are always created and enabled by artificial intelligence. So it helps us extract more and get more for less time. There's also another interesting phenomenon, which is a AI-assisted writing algorithm. So Grammarly actually announced this tool that goes through anything you write and then gives you insights on your writing. So if you wrote an article and you put it in, you can tell if the audience will think you're knowledgeable 
or you're just general, or you're an expert, it will tell you the tone for which you're actually speaking. Are you formal? Are you casual? Are you neutral? How, how do you exactly convey yourself? It also talks about the different tonalities throughout the article. So it allows us to express ourselves better, to get the right output of publishing this piece of work, and to also get insights that we don't t tend to get unless we go through peer review. And sometimes we don't have someone handy to actually review our pieces of work and give us feedback. So these specific uses of AI helps unleash the human ability. What's also happening, which is very interesting, is the fact that a lot of the journalism we're seeing today is becoming completely automated with artificial intelligence. Many of the sports-related pieces, so how many goals were scored, who scored the goals, what time of the game was the goal scored, these kind of articles today are completely automated by many of the main platforms. The fact of real estate prices and transactions and movements, business uh, transactions and the stock market, and then finally, daily notices on traffic, on congestion, these used to take people actually sitting down and typing each and every single bit of news. That has completely changed today. And we are seeing the rise of AI automated um, news pieces that help us get the news faster, that tap into all the sources available online, like Twitter, for example, and, and other social media tools, and also make sure that we are more informed. So what happens in this sense the journalist can actually go and deep dive in a topic of interest and give us something that really includes and requires human ingenuity. This is my favorite aspect of artificial intelligence. It's in the composition of music. Um, music is one of the most beautiful things that we see in terms of culture. However, unfortunately, I think like many people, many of us can't actually play an instrument. So we'd love to express ourselves but we tend to just put on our earpods, AirPods and, and listen to a good piece of music rather than try to uh, make people's ear bleed and actually play a piece of music ourselves. So how is AI entering into this field? I want you to listen to this song. This song actually was never sung by Frank Sinatra. It, it, this is generated by an artificial intelligence where they put the type of instruments, they put the lyrics in and the singer, and the song was actually composed by an artificial intelligence algorithm. So let's hope it works. Oh, sorry. It's Christmas time and you know what that means. Oh, the touch of time as I like the tree this year will be a time. It's not too bad. Oh. So, we move on. We are seeing now that AI is being used in great ways of expression. If we think about music, where can this tool be used and where can it be unleashed? And the answer is in the incredible human creatives that are creating YouTube videos, that are creating podcasts, that require audio files that today are royalty-based and need to pay money to use. We're reaching a point where we will be able to create music that is genuine, that is unique, that is incredible. So imagine if any one of you can actually write a piece of literature that Frank Sinatra can sing just for you on a special occasion. These use cases are incredible, but there is a lot of questions on IP rights and protecting people. These questions need to be answered by governments. But the other aspect as well of using AI in general terms is helping connect the creatives to the content. We look at how Angami and Spotify and Pinterest and others are using AI to ensure that every single interaction we have on the website makes us get the content we want better and better and helps us actually feel understood. So whenever you're down, you get one of the musicians that actually helps you feel excited and energized or helps you feel heard and helps you feel empathy. These kind of feelings cannot be driven by a specific 
or simple algorithm. They have to use AI to help connect the creator of the content to the consumer that wants this type of content. This is the final thing, and, and I don't know if you've seen this, but this is quite scary. This is a deep fake. Um, this isn't Tom Cruise, and it's a person trying to act like Tom Cruise. I'm going to show you some magic. It's the real thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's all the real thing. <laughs> so, deep fakes, I think, raise the, the biggest amount of ethical concern. The, it's the scariest use of artificial intelligence. It is one that we need to work constantly on trying to overcome to ensure that people are not affected negatively. And this is why in the UAE government, we announced and we launched the UAE Deepfake Guide that helps people understand how to identify a deepfake, how to overcome, for example, the use of a deepfake, and what tools exist out there to identify if something is real or fake. This same technology that raises a lot of concern actually has positive use cases. Some of the positive use cases are in education, where imagine if you go into a museum, the actual artist or historic figure that was part of that renaissance or part of that world comes and teaches you about what exactly he or she was thinking, why they wanted to build this future that we're seeing right now or this artifact, and how we can play a role. It becomes a lot more personal and the impact of it is very, very um, specific to every single individual that sees it. We also see the use of deep fakes in medicine. And here, we're not talking just about medicine, we're talking about enabling people. So we see people with ALS who lose their voices. Today they have robotic voices where if you want to type something, they type it on the keyboard, and it seems like you're talking to a robot. What if, before that person lost his or her voice, they were able to train a deep fake algorithm that will help them convey what they want in their own speech throughout their lives. These are use cases that are positive. In conclusion, I want to leave you with a very important point, which is every technology in the world has positives and negatives. And every technology in the world can be used as a tool for harm or a tool for good. We need to constantly be optimistic and embrace change but we need to also look at the negative consequences and try to proactively overcome them. I'm very happy to be with all of you here today, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.